I'm Cindy Kelly, Atomic Heritage Foundation, and today is Sunday, March 24th, 2013, and we are interviewing James A. Shokey. But first, I want him to tell us his name in full and spell it. James Asher Shokey, J-A-M-E-S, A-S-H-E-R, S-C-H-O-K-E. Great. Now, next hard questions are, what is your birth date and where were you born? I was born at 11.32 p.m., they told me, in Chicago on April 29th, 1924. Great. I have no way to refute that, so it must be right. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. Um, all right. Uh, we're here to talk about your experiences in the Manhattan Project. But first, I want you to tell us a little bit about what happened after April 29, 1924. Fill in what you did between then and, and uh, the time you joined the Manhattan Project. Well, but, um my <clears throat> mother and I and my father, of course, lived together until I was four years old. And then they got divorced. So my mother and I then <clears throat> lived with various of her sisters and their husbands and families at various times until, uh, until I, to, actually until I went into the army. Um, I, uh, of course, went to grammar school, went to high school, Sen High School in Chicago, which had 4,500 students. And, and at the time, about 70% went to college. Um, and my interests were in science right from the outset. In fact, when I was five or six years old, I got a, a, some kind of a science set, a chemistry set. And uh, that's, that's when my interest got triggered. Uh, later, when I was a, uh, when I became about 11 or 12, I uh, started a laboratory in the basement of our apartment building in which I <clears throat> did biological and, and chemical experiments, uh, you know, kid stuff, not, not grown-up stuff. And, uh, and then in high school, I... Uh, majored in, in, in science uh, because I intended to go to further my education in science. Uh, in, <clears throat> in 19, I graduated high school in February of 42 and went to um, Illinois Institute of Technology uh, majoring in, in chemical engineering to begin with and then after a year of chemical engineering, I decided I wanted to major in physics, so I changed my major. <clears throat> in that sophomore year at IIT, by the way, I might have said I was there on a full scholarship uh, uh, from a competitive exam. You can leave that in or take it out. <laughs> uh, and. Uh, in, I was classified 1AS in 1943 as a sophomore, 19 years old, and uh, then I was told that I would, the student uh, deferment would run out sh shortly. So I started to look for opportunities in the military uh, to continue my education in one way or another. <clears throat> I was, I was uh, not able to get into the V5 or V12 programs because of a bad elbow. And so I enlisted in the Signal Corps in a program designed uh, to teach you radio electronics and ultra high frequency electronics, which was new at the time. And that, that program ended up uh, in 20 weeks at the University of Chicago. And by the way, I was put in reserve. I was not in uniform when I was going to school. 
I was in the enlisted reserve of the Signal Corps. Uh, the 20 weeks at the University of Chicago was at a senior and graduate level, and I was the youngest in the class. There were, there were engineers, physicists, mathematicians in the, in the same class, uh, and I was very fortunate to get into it. Uh, I graduated second in the class, and um, then I went to, to active duty. Before I went to active duty, I was interviewed. I had two interviews uh, by people from, uh, from outside uh, of uh, the pro my program. One of them, it turned out, was uh, the people who, who um, went into that program in the military were stationed uh, in mountains in Europe uh, to man uh, communications uh, equipment. Uh, I was glad that I did not choose to go into that one. The other one, uh, I did not know what, what uh, I was being interviewed for, but uh, so I went to active duty then and um, basic training at the, in Miami Beach, Signal Corps attached to the Air Corps. Uh, they were going to send me to, uh, to radar school sooner or later. By the way, we were supposed to go to have an opportunity to go to OCS from this 20-week program. That, of course, did not happen. <laughs> that disappeared when we graduated. Uh, we went uh, to Miami Beach, and uh, there uh, it was an eight-week basic training. Uh, in the third week, uh, I might say in the fourth week, I was scheduled for kitchen duty, uh, KP they called it. And uh, But in the third week at Reveille one morning, my one-eyed corporal from Georgia who was kind of mad at the world because he couldn't be over in Europe fighting, uh, called out, Shoki, you SOB Jew, come forward. So I went forward and saluted him, went to attention. And he said, at ease, which I went, did. And he said, uh, who the F do you know in Congress? And I said, I don't know anybody, sir. He says, well, you must know somebody. The captain's got secret orders for you. It was news to me. I had no knowledge that this was happening. And uh, so I went to the captain, got my secret orders. And um, what they did is they were orders to come to Chicago and report to an armory on the south side. And it had a train ticket in there for that purpose. So uh, that's what I did. And when I <clears throat> got to Chicago, of course, I went home first. And, uh, and I was in uniform, of course. Uh, and then I, then I went to... Uh, report to the armory. On, it was on Cottage Grove on the south side of Chicago, uh, a couple of mi miles from the uh, University of Chicago campus. And uh, I reported there. And uh, they took me to, <clears throat> they took me to the University of Chicago campus to the Ryerson Physics Building and took me in and introduced me to um, the section. This was the, turned out to be the, in, um, where I was going was the instrument section of the metallurgical laboratory of the Manhattan Project, which was at the University of Chicago. And I was, of course, uh, introduced to the section um, director or manager, and uh, he was, uh, from General Electric Company, he told me. And of course, they were all older, much older than I. And then I was uh, introduced to my group leader. I was in the uh, instrument laboratory group, or la I'm sorry, laboratory instrument group. I got it backwards. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> my group leader, Wendell Bradley, was a, uh, an extremely 
competent electronics man and, and a good man to work for. There were about uh, 12 people in that group and uh, some were civilians and some were military. I was told to uh, report out of uniform and find a place to live, which I did. And uh, I got a room at a fraternity on the campus. And they were looking for boarders because they, so many of their people were in the military. <laughs> and uh, and uh, that's, so that's, uh, I was in that instrument group. And my first job was to, uh, I was I was told uh, that that they were pilfering uranium, or which was called T metal at the time, uh, from uh, Site B, which was another site on campus, uh, where they were machining uranium and putting it in, and cladding it in aluminum for the uh, X-10 reactor at Oak Ridge in order to produce plutonium. Uh, of course, I learned all of this because, only because I was going to work on an instrument to detect uranium because people were walking out with it through the security gate. There was a good reason for that. They were, uh, uranium was very heavy. It was uh, very valuable, they were, they were led to believe, by the way it was handled and treated. When it was machined, it gave, gave very uh, large uh, sparks, fiery sparks. And uh, so it was a great souvenir, <laughs> a <Yeah>, paperweight. <laughs> However, the people working on it did not know it was radioactive. And uh, they were, they had to change clothes when they came and then sh sh uh, sh change clothes again to back to their civvies uh, when they left in order that they didn't, they didn't know why, but it was to prevent them from taking radioactivity home. And uh, so I was to make an instrument which would uh, detect the chunks of uranium when they were walking out with them. And uh, I, I did develop that and it was installed and it, it worked. Uh, there was one story though that there was one man who kept setting off the alarm and they searched him every, and he, had no uranium on him and they they had him change clothes and he still turned the set off the alarm when he walked through the gate well then they we finally got him to change clothes one piece at a time and it turned out that his belt was radioactive and he was using the same belt with his civvies and with his work clothes and the radioactive belt was setting off the alarm. And so that was the end of that. Here's a picture of uh, some of my, uh, of my people in my group at the time. Uh, this gentleman, name was Gerald Landsman. He's still alive in uh, 2013. He lives on the West Coast. He, uh, went on to have, from the project, went on to have a very successful career uh, with Motorola, I believe. I believe it was Motorola and, uh, and some other companies. Uh, this, this is me and this is my group leader, Wendell Bradley. Uh, this gentleman, Tom Mitchell, became my partner later uh, which we'll talk about later. And the other gentleman 
were in various positions in the group. I went on the project in, nine, in October of 43. And uh, somebody at the uh, Army headquarters, uh, at the armory, uh, ran across my uh, Army folder and uh, saw that I had done magic in uh, high school. And uh, so I got a phone call in uh, November that said, asked me, the gentleman said, uh, do you still do magic? I said, well, I haven't for a while, but I'm sure I could. Uh, he said, well, would you, not, would you come to our um, army Christmas party at the armory and, and do a magic show for us as part of the entertainment? Well, you don't say no to a... <laughs> to an officer uh, that's above you. So I agreed to do it. And I went to the Christmas party and uh, there were about, I would guess, a hundred people at the party. And many, about half of them, or a third of them, were officers uh, in the military there. <clears throat> and the magic show went well. and. The following year, I was asked again to give a magic show, and I went. And uh, there were about half the people there, or two-thirds of the people there, and I couldn't understand why. The magic show went okay, and uh, about two weeks later, a rumor came around that uh, the Army had gotten a, gotten a rumor from Washington that the Germans had an A-bomb and they were going to drop it on Chicago on Christmas Day. So that's where why the officers weren't there at the Christmas party. <laughs> they all left town. <laughs> In uh, 44, 1944, there was a truck driver strike of some kind in Chicago. And uh, I, looked, I looked, uh, looked it up online, but I, I saw no mention of it any place as one of the strikes during the war. But at any rate, there was this strike and the drivers of the trucks for the project who ran air, all kinds of errands getting materials for the project, and for example, liquid air and liquid oxygen was needed in in everyday new supply. And uh, I got a call. Uh, I was ordered to uh, drive a truck with the. Uh, it was a uh, you know pretty good sized truck, not a trailer, but a pretty good sized truck. And uh, I was given a 45. And I had never had a gun or shot a gun. Uh, and, uh, but I had the 45. And the driver went with me. He showed me how to drive the truck. It was, the shifting was a little different than an automobile. It had four, four, four gears. Uh, and one of the places we went was uh, Air Products Company in Chicago. That's where we got the liquid air and the liquid oxygen. Uh, when we came to the to the uh, plant, there was a big bunch of people, union people, with signs uh, standing at, uh, at in front of the gate. And uh, we drove up, and uh, I opened the window, and I and uh, I said, uh, "Oh, by the way, for this purpose, I had to get back into uniform." And uh, I said, I am, you know, a military man. We're on a military uh, uh, errand, and uh, we have to go in. And they swore at us and threatened us and waved bats, and but they finally let us go in. Uh, and uh, that was 
That was my experience with the union. <laughs> I got another assignment to uh, make a special uh, filter, uh, filtered amplifier for one of the for uh, one of uh, Dr. Allison, Sam Allison, or or one of the upper f uh, physicists. Uh, I didn't know what it was for, but I I, I knew what I was supposed to do. And uh, <clears throat> the uh, it was supposed to be a tuned amplifier for 60 cycles, which is the frequency of our power uh, lines. And uh, it's a very low frequency, so the the uh, electronic items that were used that could be used to make it uh, the way my uh, group leader suggested I make it were very large. It, uh, the uh, inductor would have would have weighed 15 or 20 pounds, and uh, capacitors would have similar be very heavy and big, large. So uh, I thought about it and suddenly remembered that uh, I had, we had learned about it, what was called a twin T bridge, which was a, a bridge made only with resistors and capacitors that could be used to, uh, in an amplifier, in a feedback amplifier, to amplify its Q. The Q was a measure of how narrow the filter was. The higher the Q, the narrower the filter, and that was desirable. At any rate, so I asked my group leader if it was okay if I tried this twin T bridge in the amplifier, and he said, sure. Well, it worked, and it, the resistors and capacitors were much smaller uh, because it was a comp more complicated circuit. And, uh, and, and then I was uh, given a laboratory of, uh, with another, with a draftsman, my own laboratory, uh, as a result of that development. And, uh, and I was asked to make improvements in alpha detectors. Uh, alpha rays are uh, one type of radioactive ray. And uh, <clears throat> I worked on that for s several months and did make substantial improvements by, uh, by uh, inventing uh, a new way to use a vacuum tube uh, in, in the device. As a result of uh, those inventions, uh, the patent department of the project uh, sent a colonel to uh, file patents on behalf of the project in my name. And he would come looking for me. And it got to be, they would, uh, everybody would joke about Shoki's colonel uh, because he would come looking for me and then any rate, uh, they did they, they did file, and uh, it was my understanding that patents were granted, although I never saw them because they belonged to the uh, to the government. So were you unique uh, among your group in being so inventive? No, I was not unique. The uh, people who were brought to the Manhattan Project were very high caliber people and there were many others who were who were inventing new things all the time in in the my group and in other groups in the, around the project. What do you um, attribute? Uh, I don't know maybe you could say something along the lines that the Manhattan Project was on the frontier of many new developments in science, and you needed to be very inventive in order to be successful. Can you just, if you agree with that, could you say something like that? Well, I think it's, it's certainly true. There were, uh, they had to, in, in, um, <clears throat> to produce plutonium, 
they had to be very creative. And uh, there, there were three, actually three processes uh, for producing um, a U-238, uh, which was, uh, could be made into a bomb, U-235, I'm sorry, which could be made into a bomb and plutonium. There were three different processes uh, built very large plants, each one of them at Oak Ridge, and they, it was all new. Uh, the, the type of equipment had to be designed and, and tested and, uh, before it could be built. So uh, there were all kinds of inventions as a result of the Manhattan Project, and after the war as well. Having developed this new uh, alpha or improved alpha counter, uh, <clears throat> we had a production group uh, in our instrument section and uh, we pr actually produced instruments for other sites of the project, including Los Alamos, Monsanto, uh, in Dayton, Ohio, uh, and um, Oh, I can't remember the uranium producer in in St. Louis, but at any rate, uh, Malincrat. Malincrat. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, as a result of having uh, this improved uh, counter, uh, I was uh, uh, appointed liaison for uh, that instrument and other instruments uh, from our section. And so I started to make trips to different sites to show them how to use uh, the instruments, how to, how to uh, maintain them, and how to service them. And uh, this one of the trips was to Los Alamos. And, um, well, I, I had several trips to Los Alamos, but my first trip to Los Alamos, uh, I boarded the train at uh, 3, 3 p.m. in the afternoon. And uh, and it left for Los Alamos. Actually, it was the Santa Fe Railroad. And I was sitting in the uh, club car, reading a book. And uh, about uh, 4 p.m., a gentleman, I heard somebody say, Mr. Shokey. And I looked up and there was a gentleman standing over me and I was amazed. How did he know who I was and on this train? I'm on a secret mission. Uh, anyway, it turned out to be uh, Robert Oppenheimer's assistant, whose name escapes me right now. But uh, he invited me for uh, wine, cheese, and conversation uh, at the Robert Oppenheimer's cabin. Uh, or, uh, yeah, no, and, uh, yeah, compartment, right. At, uh, I don't know, 5.30 or 6 o'clock, which, of course, here you know, I'm a 20 year old at this point, and uh, it was very exciting. So I went. And apparently it was uh, Oppenheimer's uh, practice to do this on the train regularly. And there were oh, five to seven people, men, standing around his com compartment and talking and, and drinking. And, uh, and of course there was no talk about the project or what we were doing or where were we going or wh where were you. <laughs> so, uh, but there was uh, there was conversation about the war and and Oppenheimer liked to uh, recite poetry and he recited some poetry and uh, and uh, he invited me to call him Oppie when I was introduced to him he said you can call me Oppie and I, it I was just absolutely amazed. He, this erudite man who was so humble and, you know, willing to 
uh, have a, a young 20-year-old nobody uh, as his guest. Uh, it really was a great experience. And it, it happened one more time uh, during my uh, career on the, on the project. Um, July 16th of 1945, the first atomic bomb was set off at Almogardo, New Mexico. It was called the Trinity Experiment and it went off success, successfully. I was not there. Uh, there were a few people from our instrument section who were there. And, but a few, I don't know, there was one or two days later uh, we were invited, all of the people in our sec instrument section and other sections at MetLab were invited to watch a color movie of, of the uh, bomb going off. And it, of course we were all very excited uh, by it. And uh, then in August, in, on August uh, 5th or 6th, uh, the first bomb was dropped on Hiroshima, and uh, on the 9th, another bomb was dropped on Nagasaki. And at this point, we knew the war was going to be over pretty soon. So people started to think about what's next. What do I do after I leave the Met Lab? Of course, I had an education to finish, which I intended to do at night. But I also had this, got this idea that uh, radioactivity and radioactive isotopes of, of the elements were going to be used uh, by these people who went back to their universities, professors, and uh, that there was going to be a market for some of the instruments that that my group were, had produced. So I told my idea to my group leader and uh, you know I told him I was thinking about starting a company and he said gee that's a good idea I'll join you and there were two other uh, fellows in the in the uh, SED, which was uh, what what the uh, military special engineering detachment of the Corps of Engineers we were in, uh, Tom Mitchell and John Karenz had were two of my friends that I had worked with in building some amplifiers for my wife's uncle who who was who had an electronics business. And uh, of course, electronics was in very short supply other than for military pur purposes. But he happened to run across some uh, phonograph motors that were available, <clears throat> 50 of them. And he decided that he was going to make uh, 50 phonographs for sale. Uh, they needed an amplifier to amplify the a signal from the from the from the arm of the of the uh, player, and he asked me if uh, if we would be willing to do it, if I would be willing to do it, and I asked these two friends if they would join me and if they were interested in building these things, and they were. So we built these things, and uh, so when it came time to think about what to do after the war and and uh, my thoughts about starting a business, I included them. And they were interested as well. So when the war ended, uh, I was the first, fortunately, the first one out of the military. Somebody made a mistake and gave me six months worth of points that I, I didn't earn. <laughs> but I accepted them <laughs> and got out early. Uh, and so uh, I went and uh, rented a storefront on uh, 
on 53rd, 55th Street, and uh, which was uh, a main, dra main drag uh, near the campus. And uh, we each borrowed $4,000 uh, from a bank and under the GI Bill. And um, so we, with $12,000, we started our business. It was called Instrument Development Laboratory. <clears throat> and we started uh, by making, of course, it took a little time to build the benches and get all the materials we needed to to actually make uh, products for sale. But we started with uh, making an instrument that had <clears throat> we had been building for the project. I started that uh, company in February of '46, and my two partners joined me uh, three months later when they got out of the Army. Our first order uh, came from uh, Dr. Sugarman at the University of Chicago. He wanted to order one of our instruments and uh, but the, universe, the purchasing department of the University of Chicago uh, checked on us and saw that we were a brand new company with very little capital and they said no to him. Uh, <clears throat> and this was very disappointing to us. So I asked him if he could arrange a meeting with the purchasing agent, Dr. Sugarman, and he did. And we bought, he went with me and we had this meeting and we explained to him <clears throat> where we came from and what we what we were doing and he agreed to buy the instrument from us so that was the first and then we we uh, mailed sheets around to various universities to, to people but we we bought a mailing list of physicists and uh, chemists and so forth and uh, business started to develop and uh, After uh, uh, a year, this was in uh, nine. Well, this was several years later, 1949. This uh, article was written. This is just one page of the article that was written in Popular Mechanics. Uh, can you see it? Doesn't matter. And uh, we were very fortunate to get that publicity because that brought us more business. And. In, uh, <clears throat> Can you just uh, tell what was the, um, the title of that article? Is Million Dollar Baby of the Atom Age? Yes. So who's the million dollar baby? The company. <laughs> uh, and the picture of um, this handsome man. Here, who is the handsome man in the photograph? I believe that's me. And what do you have? What is that's a um, that's an apparatus, a, a vacuum system, uh, for making Geiger counters. Uh, that's what that is. So it looks very complicated. Is that something you recreated from memory, from what had you done uh, during the war? There were we hired people who who had made. Got your counters on the project, so uh, so uh, they knew how to make them and how to get the apparatus built for making them. And uh, similarly, as our business uh, grew and as we added product lines, we added radioactive chemicals, uh, and we hired uh, uh, radioactive chemists from that had been on the project. To head up our uh, our chemistry and manufacture uh, uh, chemicals with radioactive isotopes that were acquired from uh, the Atomic Energy Commission, uh, the X10 reactor was used for producing these uh, isot radioactive isotopes, and uh, 
and we incorporated the, well, we sold the isotopes as we bought them uh, in smaller quantities to people. Uh, and then we also incorporated the isotopes into various chemicals for uh, experimentation. For example, digitalis. Uh, we made radioactive digitalis for, for heart uh, research. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> and then uh, as we grew, we needed more capital. So uh, we went to family and friends for $30,000. And each one of us uh, had the uh, job of getting $10,000 from family and friends. And we sold uh, $500 units. Uh, my wife's father uh, was uh, very helpful in that regard. He, he himself uh, invested in us and he got uh, friends to invest in us. Uh, I, um, um, my mother had, uh, we, I had uh, five uncles uh, who were married to my mother's sisters and um, in Chicago and none of them invested in my company except for the poorest one. He actually took from under his mattress because people after the depression and the bank failures, some people kept their money in the ma under the mattress. <laughs> he took $250 and we agreed to sell him a half share, a half interest. And he did. And uh, I'm very happy to, he was able to retire on the money he made later in life. Uh, so at any rate, we, we, we successfully raised the $30,000 and then a year and a half later, we needed more capital and uh, we had comp competitors at this time. One of them was called Tracer Lab, another was called Atomic Instruments uh, Company and they were in the Boston area, both of them. Uh, Tracer Lab was financed uh, by one of the first venture capital companies called uh, American Research and Development Corporation and it was headed by a former professor in the Harvard Business School, General George Dorio, uh, who had come from France originally, he had a French accent. Tracer Lab had, had a public offering uh, about six months earlier of a million dollars. Uh, we uh, went out for $300,000, which was the, the uh, had, there were certain benefits uh, in uh, less paperwork if you stayed at $300,000. So we stayed at $300,000 and uh, had a successful uh, st sale of our stock and uh, we were sold over the counter, uh, bought and sold over the counter our stock. Earlier, a uh, couple of years before that, I had started uh, Atomic Instruments Manufacturing Association uh, and uh, <clears throat> which included our competition and uh, which was gradually growing. And there were other companies making uh, not the same products, but different products that were needed uh, for measuring radioactivity or using it. And, and they all joined uh, this association. I was its first president. And we had an exhibition in New York at the Commodore Hotel. And uh, it was in a, in a ballroom of the hotel. And uh, on Sunday morning, uh, our, our, exhibit, our exhibition went on for three or four days in this ballroom. And people came from all over the country to see the instruments that, you know, and various products that were available. 
On Sunday morning, uh, before the exhibition opened, uh, I was there uh, along with others uh, preparing our booth uh, for the opening. And uh, <clears throat> all of a sudden there were, at one end of the, of the uh, hall, there was activity, there were lights, there was cameraman, and there was a little set of a chair, and, uh, and uh, so I went over to see what was going on. And uh, Mrs. Roosevelt walked in. She was being interviewed. She had a program apparently every week at that time. Her son James was there, and Faye Emerson was also there. And I got to meet all of them. And uh, Mrs. Roosevelt asked me to, after she was done with her interview, if she could come and see the exhibition. So she did uh, with her son and Faye Emerson, and uh, I conducted them through the exhibition. And that was, that was a very pleasant endeavor. Some of the notable accomplishments of, uh, I might say that the name was changed, I should say, the name was changed from Instrument Development Laboratories to uh, Nuclear Instrument and Chemical Corporation about a year after we started because another company had prior rights to the name Instrument Development Laboratory and they informed us so we had to change our name. And subsequently uh, we changed our name to Nuclear Chicago. And the reason was that companies were shortening their names at that time. That was the beginning of, of uh, companies condensing their names. And so we joined the, uh, the movement. Uh, so Nuclear Chicago became our, our name. Uh, some of the notable accomplishments, if you don't mind, I'd like to read them. Uh, I negotiated worldwide distribution of radioactive isotopes for Amers Amersham in England, which was the, a Queen's company uh, that was the equivalent of the Atomic Energy Commission in the U.S. And we had the exclusive distributorship rights, uh, first to North and South America and then worldwide. Uh, Could you explain? Uh, so they were the equivalent of the AEC, the Atomic Energy Commission? Atomic Energy Commission was making and selling radioactive isotopes. Amersham did the same thing in, for, for England, for the British uh, Atomic Energy Program and selling them to industry and, you know, so forth. Uh, and we got the exclusive distributorship for that. Uh, we made the uh, first commercial instrument for thyroid uptake studies, which was a medical diagnostic uh, technique that was uh, developed by uh, one, well, at least one doctor at the University of Chicago. And we worked with him in the, as he developed the, the, uh, the, the, the uh, procedure. And then we designed special instruments for commercial sale for that procedure. I think there's a photo of that in this article in Popular Mechanics. Of Might a be. A girl with a tube uh, that you put near uh, yeah. the throat. Yes. Can you? Describe that because we could show the. Well, iodine 131 is a radioactive form of iodine, and, and iodine, of course, is uh, secreted by the thyroid. And it, it, the, <coughs> the rate of uptake of the iodine uh, into the thyroid is a measure of whether you're hypothyroid, uh, normal, or hyperthyroid, and uh, that's how what what what, what was done. Uh, we made the uh, first neutron portable neutron monitor uh, for the Nautilus, which was the first uh, atomic submarine, and. Uh, 
for Sears and Roebuck, uh, we made a mass-produced uh, Geiger counter for looking for uranium, which, which they sold in, in great quantities. Uh, and it, it actually could, could find uranium. People, there was a, a big, uh, like a gold rush, uh, at, at, during this period when all kinds of people were buying equipment and going on their vacations to look for uranium in uh, various places in the U.S. where it was known to exist and in Canada as well. So what created the demand? Did you explain? For uranium? Uh, all of the reactors that were uh, uh, being built uh, for power after the war. There were, uh, for, for a while, there was a, a big um, uh, powerful movement to go to atomic power, which uh, unfortunately was uh, blown up by uh, the Three Mile Island uh, uh, disaster uh, in, near Pittsburgh, I think it was. Uh, where a, uh, where there was a uh, a uh, overheating of a reactor and some radioactivity was uh, thrown into the a atmosphere, and uh, I don't know if anybody died, but uh, they probably uh, those people who were exposed uh, may have gotten cancer early in their life if they didn't. Or, I don't think they were exposed uh, to uh, to deadly uh, to a deadly amount of radiation at the time. We also made a special Geiger counter for uh, A.C. Gilbert and Company that uh, was known for erector sets and other uh, uh, mechanical and scientific type things. They came out with an atomic energy kit which had a Geiger counter in it and some radioactive, uh, encapsulated radioactive materials so that you could do experiments uh, with showing how to measure radioactivity. Would such a uh, toy, or it, it was for children, right? It was for Yeah, it was yeah, for children, learn. right. Yes. Um, would that have been allowed today? Would you be able to? Yes, the, the, yes, uh, the, uh, the amount of radioactivity was not in any way dangerous, and it was completely encapsulated in plastic. So, uh, but the Geiger counters are very sensitive, so they they can pick up small amounts of radiation. Uh, we were involved in the development of the first PET scanner for a, a brain tumor. Uh, diagnosis. Uh, Maybe you want to say what PET stands for. People will think it's for small animals. No. <laughs> oh, uh, positive emitting something. <laughs> uh, positive emitting. I can't remember what the T is for, but uh, uh, the positive emitting radioactive isotope was injected in a form that was uh, uh, attracted, that uh, would be absorbed by brain tumors. So then the brain tumor would become radioactive and they could, uh, uh, first of all, determine that there was one, and secondly, even be uh, located uh, by proper use of uh, uh, detectors. Uh, we. Uh, we were the first ones to make a large, uh, what was called uh, uh, gamma source, a source of gamma radiation, which is the most penetrating radiation. Uh, and it was used for radiography, like x-rays, only for uh, thicker and heavier uh, objects. Uh, it, We made the first uh, commercial carbon-14 detector, uh, radioactive carbon-14, 
is in uh, occurs in nature um, and um, and also is produced can be produced in a reactor and it can be used uh, well chemicals uh, organic chemicals can be made uh, with carbon-14 so that they can be traced in chemical reactions and also in uh, hu body reactions uh, so it was a, it was a research a research tool uh, to be able to use carbon-14 and uh, and the, uh, this detector had to be very special because carbon for the emissions, the radioactive emissions of carbon 14 were very low energy. So the carbon 14 had to be introduced inside the detector in order to be detected because e even the thinnest wall would block the carbon 14 uh, radiation. So this was a special detector. One of the uh, applications that uh, came out of uh, <coughs> of uh, our, uh, the work that uh, the, the ability to measure carbon-14 uh, and other uh, radioactive isotopes was uh, archaeological and uh, geological uh, dating of uh, materials. Uh, because the amount of carbon-14 in a material uh, showed how long it was dead. So uh, you could, if it had been dead for thousands of years, you could determine when it existed alive or when it died uh, from the remaining carbon-14 in the item because radioactive substances uh, degrade they have a half-life and, and they gradually, every, every half-life, the amount of radioactivity goes, goes in half. And that's why if you measure the remaining amount of carbon-14 and life, living um, things interchanges with the atmosphere so that it maintains a steady level uh, of carbon-14 in the, in, in the device, in the uh, substance whether it's a human being, an animal, or, or a plant. And, uh, and so when it dies, the, it no longer exchanges carbon-14, carbon with the atmosphere, and so the carbon-14 doesn't get replenished, and it gradually disappears, and by measuring how much is left, you can determine when it died. And your device. Pardon me? And your device was, was one of the first to be able to, to measure uh, carbon 14, yes. Did someone order that or did you just think this would be a good thing to measure? Did oh no, we knew it had the, there had been, uh, Dr. Libby at the University of Chicago had uh, started experiments on um, uh, geological dating and uh, he was the first one to do it, as far as I know. Uh, and he, he would make a detector and put the carbon-14 in, inside the detector as a, as a gas, as CO2, carbon dioxide, and, and make it so that he put it inside the detector and then the detector. But that was a very uh, difficult uh, procedure to have to go through to, to measure a, a carbon-14 sample. You had to convert it to carbon dioxide, and you had to make sure you collected all of the carbon dioxide, and then were able to put it inside a detector. So it was a very uh, laborious procedure. But he developed the, the, the first carbon dating, Dr. Libby, Willard Libby, if I remember correctly. There was all kinds of research uh, using radioactively tagged chemicals uh, to follow reactions and test their efficacy. Uh, test, uh, for example, one, you could test the uh, eff efficacy of a washing machine uh, with radioactive, uh, by putting radioactive dirt uh, or its equivalent in whatever you were uh, 
trying to and then after the washing de determine how much was left so uh, in other words you measure it before and after and you could tell the efficacy of the washing uh, nuclear chicago was not involved in it but uh one of the uh, early industrial applications of uh, radioactivity were beta and gamma gauges uh, for measuring and controlling the thickness of plastic, paper, and metal as it's being produced. Uh, uh, sheets or, or uh, rolls, uh, continuous rolls, uh, were produced, uh, could be controlled, measured and controlled uh, with beta gauges. Uh, that measured the absorption of, of beta rays, one of the uh, radioact forms of radioactivity, by the material. And the last application that I uh, think of, and we were not involved in that one either, was smoke detectors. Uh, smoke detectors used uh, uh, a radioactive isotope to uh, that uh, when the smoke came in the detector, it absorbed the uh, radioactivity and, and, and uh, the alarm would go off as a result. I left Nucle Nuclear Chicago. Uh, we, uh, at some point, we agreed to disagree uh, our, uh, as partners and I, I decided to leave. And uh, uh, later, uh, Nuclear Chicago was uh, later sold to uh, G.D. Searle, which was a pharmaceutical company that uh, later was sold itself to Monsanto, a uh, chemical company. Uh, and then uh, later, uh, uh, Searle, before it was sold to Monsanto, disposed of uh, many of its uh, acquisitions uh, when a new a new president came in, he decided he didn't want all these little companies, and he uh, he sold uh, Nuclear Chicago to Siemens, so it became a part of a very large company, uh, uh, a German company, but very big in the United States as well. A banker friend of mine uh, that uh, that we were doing business with. Uh, uh, heard that I left uh, Nuclear Chicago and uh, he called me on the phone and uh, he said, I'd like you to meet my father-in-law. <clears throat> and uh, so he arranged it and I went to uh, meet this gentleman. His name was Champ Carey. And uh, he was the uh, president and chairman of the board of Pullman Company. Uh, which was the uh, a company that uh, that made uh, freight cars. They no longer made Pullman uh, uh, sleeping cars, but they made freight cars. And they also had a company called Kellogg Company, which was uh, a big engineering firm in the petrochemical oil and petrochemical business, designing and building plants uh, in that field of endeavor. <clears throat> when I visited Champ Carey, I visited him. He invited me to his home, which was not too far away from where I live in the Chicago suburb. And uh, he said that uh, Pullman had a lot of excess capital and he wanted to uh, do some acquisitions and his uh, director of research was already uh, looking into possibility of acquisitions for him. But he, because I was uh, familiar with new, new fields of endeavor, uh, like atomic energy and, and instrumentation, measurement instrumentation, he thought I might be able to help him, help his uh, director of research uh, examine some of the newer possibility, new company possibilities, uh, newer industries. Uh, so he asked me to come to work for him as a consultant, which I did. 
Interestingly, uh, Champ Carey's office uh, in the uh, building that Pullman Inc. was in downtown office uh, in Chicago uh, had been the office of Robert Lincoln, who at one time, who was the son of A. Lincoln, who at one time was with the Pullman Company, was the president of the Pullman Company. And he, so he, his office was the same office. Uh, I was uh, I was welcomed at Pullman uh, by everybody except the guy I was supposed to work with. Uh, <laughs> and um, yeah, he, he was a very, very bright, intelligent man, but uh, he didn't want to give ground to a young whippersnapper at all. And uh, so in effect, I had to do Whatever acquisitions I might find for Champ Carey, I had to do myself without his advice and, uh, and report separately from him. That's how it turned out. I did uh, find some acquisitions for uh, Champ Carey and I wrote a report and um, and the uh, director of research wrote his report on what he thought the company should acquire. My report, uh, I thought that uh, Kellogg uh, was an ideal company uh, to put, to acquire instrument companies because they used many instruments in their plants, the plants that they designed for controlling and uh, the processes and, and so forth. So uh, my, my the companies that I suggested were such companies. Uh, and my report was presented to the board, but uh, Champ Carey, I was surprised he didn't have an opinion. He left it entirely to the board members. And I thought that was a mistake uh, if the president doesn't have an opinion, uh, then then you have to say no, right? If he isn't going to sell it, and that's what they did. They said no to those acquisitions, and instead, they they uh, acquired the company that the director of research had recommended, which was a uh, a small uh, earth moving machinery company out on the west coast that went bankrupt four years after they bought it, that they closed. <laughs> so at any rate, that's the way it goes. You don't win them all. <laughs> um, uh, I also, uh, while I was at uh, Pullman, I was introduced to the uh, director of manufacturing, and he took me to some of their plants to visit some of their plants, and I saw opportunities for automation. Automation was the big word uh, at that time. It was the beginning of so-called automation in industry. And I saw some possibilities for automation in, in their plants, and uh, actually designed one piece of equipment for, for one of the operations in their freight car uh, manufacturing plant, which they which they uh, had built and put into effect. And, and, they, and uh, then I decided it was time for me to go back into my own business. So I started to, uh, and, a, and a friend, a family friend was retiring and he had a small business that he wanted to sell. Uh, and uh, he, he invited me to come and I went and decided, okay, it wasn't, uh, going to be a lot of money and uh, and it looked like it might have possibilities. Uh, so I uh, resigned from uh, my consultancy at uh, Pullman and Champ Carey was very disappointed. He, he said he wanted me to become a permanent uh, employee of the company and, uh, and, I, and I thanked him and I said, uh, I'm. This is my route, <laughs> and uh, 
And he was understanding and remained a friend. So I bought this company, which was called Zeleny Thermometer Company. It made uh, multi-point temperature measurement instruments for grain elevators uh, to measure so-called hot spots in the grain bins. Hot spots developed when there was infestation uh, in the bin. And uh, in other words, insects that uh, started multiplying uh, developed heat. And uh, by having cables uh, with temperature measurement devices in them hanging in the bins, you could, and, and taking uh, measurements uh, regularly, you could d determine when these uh, hot spots were occurring and uh, take measures to, uh, to kill the insects uh, one way or another. Uh, unfortunately for me, uh, when I went to a grain elevator to sell my uh, product, uh, I got an asthma attack. So <laughs> I was a serious asthma attack. Uh, every time, so I, I would. With, I had the company for two years and um, developed uh, developed uh, a uh, automatic scanning system. The the uh, ones that the comp my company made and, and the competition made at that time were uh, manual. You went you went from detector to detector and wrote down the temperature. Uh, my device was automatic. It scanned the temperatures and, pr and had a uh, typewriter printout. And as a result of that, I was approached by my chief competitor that was owned by a New York Stock Exchange company. And they wanted to buy me out. And because of the, uh, the asthma attacks, I was willing to sell. <laughs> And so I sold out, sold out that company after two years. We also, in that company, I also made uh, an, er, uh, an electronic scale for uh, a meat packer uh, that uh, weighed the, uh, the carcasses as they were going down a, uh, a, a what do you call it, a, a belt. Uh, and uh, I, would have tried to pursue that further if, uh, if I had stayed with the company. When I sold the, the uh, company to uh, Neptune Meter Company, sold uh, Zeleny to the Neptune Meter Company, they first asked me to come to uh, Des Moines, to move to Des Moines to help them integrate it with uh, the company they had. So my, we moved to Des Moines, Iowa at the time, and uh, uh, and I was there for a year, and then they asked me, a uh, Neptune Meter Company asked me to move east to Connecticut to uh, head up, uh, uh, to become their director of R&D, research and development, for their instrument division. They had a number of instrument companies, and they, wanted to try to consolidate them and get a uh, our, uh, research and development new products developed for it. So I went east uh, and uh, <clears throat> I could have officed in New York, but I chose to office at one of the plants in Connecticut where we were living. And uh, I was with them for, I don't know, two or three years and we, did, we developed, we we developed some new instruments, but uh, I wasn't happy there. Uh, I didn't, I didn't feel comfortable, so um, we decided to to leave and look look for something else. At that time, uh, <clears throat> my neighbor, who was also a tennis partner of mine, and. Uh, I uh, had been a mechanical engineer, uh, heard about a company in Stamford, Connecticut, not too, you know, 20 minutes away from where we lived, 
uh, that was for sale. And it was a, uh, it made tachometers and electric motors. So he and I looked into it and we bought it. Uh, and we were partners and uh, for five years. And uh, <clears throat> then I, would, I, I became uh, unhappy with the business. Uh, I felt that we weren't able to grow it the way I would have liked. And so I started to look for another opportunity. And uh, I sold out to him and bought a company of a gentleman who was retiring, who had started the company. It was called uh, Voltark Tubes. And it was in uh, Fairfield, Connecticut, which was the neighboring town to where we lived in Westport. Uh, he had about uh, 55 employees and uh, was a very profitable company. And uh, I bought it and, uh, and uh, was there, had it for 22 years. And we went from 55 employees to a little over 400 employees and, uh, and profitable. Uh, in that time, and we we developed a lot of new products. The uh, we made uh, specialized fluorescent lamps, and ultraviolet lamps, and uh, materials, uh, and lamps for uh, electric signs. Uh, we made the mat raw materials for neon signs, for example, and we made uh, fluorescent specialized fluorescent lamps for uh, plastic, so-called plastic signs that had fluorescent lamps inside the plastic. Uh, we made fluorescent lamps, uh, by the way, it was world, we, we made them for, for applications worldwide. Uh, we made lamps that the large lamp, fluorescent lamp companies weren't interested in making because the quantities weren't hot, large enough. Uh, and they were, too, you know, they required special engineering and it just wasn't worthwhile. In fact, even though their policies did not permit it, their salesmen uh, <laughs> used to send customers to us when they, when they couldn't, when they heard of an application that they couldn't fulfill. Uh, so that, that, uh, that was my uh, last business and uh, in 1989, I retired, sold it, and retired. End of story. Wow. <laughs> Goodness me. That, that's uh, remarkable. That's a great, long Fun. Uh, history of innovation and change and looking for new challenges. And yeah, it was. It was, so it, was a, it was a lot of fun. Yeah. So how much of your... Um, what you became over the last 70 years was formed by your experience in the Manhattan Project. What, what did you learn from that that, you, that informed what you did later? Well, uh, the first thing uh, that I learned on the Manhattan Project was that I had some ability to solve problems with new means, and uh, and uh, and that that was, of course, paramount in all of the positions and companies that I that I uh, was involved with. Uh, other than that, I'm not sure. Well, of course, I learned uh, <clears throat> I learned some electronics while on while I w w worked on the Manhattan Project uh, that I didn't you know electronics that I didn't know, and uh, I also learned uh, for, for for nuclear Chicago. I learned a lot about reactors and radioactive isotopes on the project. So that was 
that was uh, absolute necessity for nuclear Chicago. And uh, so, knowing of your competition, knowing of other companies that were getting involved in nucleonics, if you like. Um, how many of those companies do you think were spawned by people who actually worked on the Manhattan Project or maybe learned from Manhattan Project veterans who, like Sam Allison you mentioned, or others who were um, also professors? I would say uh, about two-thirds of them. Can you make there were probably, so we can huh? I would say about two thirds of the of the uh, companies that that I knew about when I was in in the uh, atomic instrument industry uh, were 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 uh, started by people who had been on the project or who were coached by somebody who had been on the project. Uh, I don't know uh, uh, about Tracer Lab, which was, of course, the biggest, the largest company until they went bust. Uh, in effect, went bust. They sold. They had to sell out to another company because uh, they bought uh, a white elephant with their million dollars that they got in their public offering. They bought a company called Kelly Kett X-Ray company which was going downhill fast and and in effect took Tracer Lab down with it. It was as big or bigger than Tracer Lab when they bought it. And uh, it was a it was a big mistake. And Tracer Lab sold out to a company called uh, Laboratory for Electronics, I think was the name of it, which was a large uh, company. And uh, we were the dominant, uh, we became the dominant company in the field uh, and uh, otherwise they would have been probably. But I don't know where their, where their starters, where the starting people from uh, at Tracer Lab came from. Uh, uh, the president, uh, the guy who started the company, one of them was uh, named Bill Barber. And he, he did not come from the Manhattan Project. Uh, how he decided to get into it, I never never found out. Uh, Fred Henricus, Dr. Fred Henricus, who was his, his main technical man, did have some, uh, I don't know exactly what, but he did have some experience with the Manhattan Project at MIT. Uh, so, but there were others who, uh, smaller companies that came from, came from the man, people who came from the Manhattan Project. Maybe you could just talk about the importance of, of science and engineering and technology and innovation to uh, the well-being of our society through the many applications it has. Well, I think uh, that it, the STEM, uh, which is a current, a, a currently in use acronym for science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, is right on. We are we have been derelict here in the U.S. Uh, in uh, developing the talent we have, particularly people who, could, who can't afford to go to college. Most uh, uh, highly developed countries send anybody who is capable to college. They make sure they get to go. And so they get that, develop that talent uh, and uh, get the use of it. And we have not done that in this country, unfortunately. We have not uh, encouraged uh, talented minority by giving them scholarships. Uh, and uh, 
now we're dependent upon uh, bringing uh, scientists in from other countries, bringing, importing them, and uh, <clears throat> and uh, a lot of people come here. Uh, uh, young people come here for their uh, scientific education uh, in our colleges, but now, like from India, they used to stay here. They used to like. Now they go back because there's so much need for them back in their home country. The same for China. A lot of Chinese came here or come here for their education, their scientific education or engineering education. Now. Most of them go back to China because they have opportunities there. Uh, so we have to do it with our own uh, talent. We have to develop our talent. And STEM is a good idea if Congress does something to develop it and, and make it uh, a going uh, enterprise. That was good. Um, you mentioned, just looking at your own personal history, about having a, an erector set or a, or a chemistry set um, when you were a very young boy. Um, can you remember other aspects about your childhood that, that encouraged you to go into science, that maybe there are things we could learn from? The main thrust aside from my own uh, interests uh, as a young man, uh, came from high school. I had two high school teachers that, uh, <clears throat> that made physics and chemistry, uh, that made physics and chemistry very exciting and uh, encouraged uh, my best friend and, uh, and I to go into one or the other. And uh, my best friend in high school was uh, doctor, became Dr. Bert Fried, a physicist uh, who got his PhD at the University of Chicago and, uh, and then uh, became uh, a professor at UCLA and uh, also a consultant to industry. And uh, so we both were, were uh, encouraged and, and felt that we really desired to, d to do that. And then when we, we both got scholarships to IIT, Illinois Institute of Technology, um, our first chemistry professor continued that encouragement and um, we worked for him part time in his research laboratory. Uh, he asked us to, and uh, so and, and paid us a small amount, you know, and uh, and that that encouraged us to pursue it further. That's interesting. Um, there are programs that uh, the National Laboratories has have had that give high school. Uh, students a chance to you know have internships in the summer and that's and great. That's kind of things. That's great. Yeah. Of course, in jeopardy. Not, not not my time. <laughs> right, but I can see that that is uh, important. Um, let's see. What about um, security and secrecy? You you seem to have been in the know about you know or, or were you? Did you feel you knew what the purpose of the Manhattan Project was? Did you have the big picture? Um, I had a Q clearance, which was at that time the highest clearance uh, you could get, but information was available on, only on a need-to-know basis. That was the, the policy. Uh, that doesn't mean that you didn't hear things that you shouldn't have heard, because you did, you know, in the, in the course of relationships with other people on the project. Uh, but my, my, my work, my particular, the, my assignments uh, made me have to learn about things that 
uranium, uh, a polonium, which was an alpha emitter when I was uh, developing the alpha improvements in the alpha detector, and uh, other alpha emitters, which were involved in the um, polonium was part of the uh, trigger for the bomb. Uh, and uh, so that's how I happened to learn. Plus, uh, Fermi and his uh, assistant, uh, Dr. Morrison, young man, uh, gave lectures on, which we were invited to, on pile theory and uh, radioactivity. So that, that we learned about uh, by the lectures. Were you aware that there were spies? Were there counter spies? I mean, was there at, at the Met Lab? Are, were you aware of a, a lot of? Um, you know? The only uh, the only incident that I can think of that there's an answer to that question is that I was living at a graduate fraternity uh, called Gamma Alpha, and of course I was not a graduate, but I, uh, I was with mostly graduate chemists, physicists, and engineers who were on the project. Mostly, uh, there were also some Navy uh, medical students uh, who live, were living at Gamma Alpha. But uh, we had, they had parties, and uh, and there was uh, one uh, very attractive uh, young lady who uh, came to these parties. Uh, you know, was invited by somebody, and. Uh, So one day she disappeared from campus, and the rumor was, and she, she did not work on the Manhattan Project, the rumor was that she had been uh, spying and getting information from the people she was dating. I don't know if it's true or not. <laughs> That's the only knowledge I, I had of any possible spy. Um, following up the, the attractive women <laughs> theory here, or not a theory, um, did you ever run across Leona Woods Marshall while you were at the Yes. Yes, I did. Uh, Can you tell us about her and use her name? Well, I, uh, I didn't, uh, I can't say I really knew her, but yes, she was there and I knew of her, I knew who she was. Yes, but I didn't, I, I can't say I knew her well, because I didn't. I think one of her husbands was Libby, but I'm not sure it's the same. Dr. Libby? Oh, really? Could be. Um, but she turned out to be Fermi's right-hand man. So yes, she, yes. Yes, she was. How many, uh, other than Leo? I played tennis doubles with Fermi once. I was a pretty good tennis player, and he uh, he he heard that, and he invited me to play against uh, uh, a couple of uh, University of Chicago tennis players. Uh, <laughs> so you were partners. Yeah, we were partners. We got beaten. <laughs> he was like Oppenheimer. He was, you know, a humble man. He was a very nice man. Dr. Fermi. Tough to understand when he lectured because of his heavy accent. I read the other day that when he was working on the Chicago Pile One, that he was also trying to teach himself English and was reading Winnie the Pooh, and that he named various parts of the Chicago Pile One Eeyore and Piglet and Oh, Peter. could be. I was not aware. I, would, of course, was not involved in that. I'm not sure it's true, but that's what I heard. 
Dr. Fermi, after the war, uh, was, state, uh, was on the staff of the University of Chicago, and he specifically requested, among other classes, that he be permitted to teach sophomore physics. And to me, that showed uh, what kind of a real man he was uh, to want to uh, encourage uh, young students. Read a lot about Arthur Holly Compton. Did you have any? Didn't know him. Yeah. Um, and when you mentioned uh, General Electric Jeffries, did you mention earlier you were talking about someone who headed up a committee? No, the head of the head of the when I got when I arrived uh, uh, in the instrument section, the the head of it was Valney Wilson, who had uh, Dr. Valney Wilson, who had come from General Electric Company. So, in your experience, then they recruited not only people like yourself out of the army, but also from industry. And oh yes, uh, you know the uh, Met, the Met Lab task uh, was originally was to uh, develop the processes uh, of, of, of using uh, nuclear reactors or piles, as they were called then, for producing plutonium. That's really what MetLab uh, was about, and uh, so uh, and and Dupont was uh, the main contractor for uh, uh, the X10 reactor, and so there were Dupont people uh, at MetLab and also coming and going. Uh, to work with us and learn what they had to learn in order to design uh, X10 reactor and the chemical processes required to uh, separate plutonium. Did you ever hear of Crawford Greenwald? Crawford Greenwald, did you? Yes, he was, uh, I think he was DuPont uh, president at the time. I never met him. I didn't know him. Actually, he became president after the war. And oh. at the time, he was sort of the liaison between DuPont and Fermi in trying to get the reactor designs for Hanford, primarily. I'm not sure yeah. he worked much on it. That came later, yeah. yeah. So tell me how you met your wife. <laughs> My wife and I grew up together. From, uh, we were neighbors from about 11 or 12 years old. She moved into the, bu uh, into the building where I was living with, uh, my mother and I were living with uh, an aunt and uncle. And uh, that's how we met. <laughs> so we were uh, high school sweethearts. <laughs> and how old were you when you were married? Uh, I was uh, married uh, a month before my uh, 21st birthday. Did your uh, mother think this is a rather tender age to get married, or? She would, no, if she did, she didn't tell me. Uh, she had to sign for me in order to get married, because at that time the age, the marriage age was 21 or the voting age was 21. So did your wife enjoy all the um, living in Chicago? I guess she's from Chicago, so yeah. there was no change. Right, right. Yeah. yeah. When we first got married, we lived on a fourth floor walk up uh, on campus. And uh, And that, right? <laughs> Great, that's terrific. Wow. Can you, um, I'm just throwing out little oddball questions now. Uh, can you tell us um, 
How would you define nucleonics? Nucleonics was, I don't know who, who invented it, but it was the term used for the uh, new industry that uh, derived from the uh, atomic bomb, the Manhattan Project, uh, that uh, involved uh, radiation, radioactive isotopes, uh, and uh, the necessary instruments and other devices that were required to apply them to industry, medicine, and research of all kinds. And uh, so that was the term that the the uh, for that industry. So looking back at it, it started you know in this cradle of the Manhattan Project. Um, how would you describe the industry today? I I have to say I really don't know what the industry is today. I've lost touch with it. So uh, I, I, I honestly don't know what it's like. Uh, McGraw-Hill uh, published a magazine called Nucleonics uh, for uh, some years, but then they dropped it. I don't know why. And I was out of the industry by that time, so I didn't, uh, I didn't know why they dropped it. Whether the industry got too big or too small, I don't know. <laughs> right after the war, there was a lot of effort. There was a lot of effort early on to try to explain to the American public what all of this was about. Uh, and uh, some people remember seeing cartoons, My Friend the Atom, and things like that. Oh yeah, there were, there were, uh, there were actually cartoon magazines uh, that, uh, talked about the atom and, and uh, things like that. At least one I, re I remember seeing. How do you think you've been in touch you know, all these years with the American public and their attitudes toward things nuclear? How do you think it's changed over the last 70 years? Well, I don't think the American public knows uh, for the most part the Amer American public I don't uh, does not know of all of the wonderful applications that have come from the uh, nuclear uh, the nucleonics industry uh, I, I, I don't think they're aware for the most part of what you know they know a few things that and they may not even tie tie it to the uh, to the atom bomb or to the Manhattan Project. For example, the PET uh, PET scanner. Uh, I'm I'm not sure people know that that is a result, really, of the Manhattan Project. Uh, you know, down the road, of course, but. If we hadn't had a Manhattan Project, uh, I don't think we would have had PET scanners. There seems to be um, an effort by the nuclear energy industry, anyway, to disassociate itself from the Manhattan Project and the atomic bomb. Really, I'm not aware of that. Yeah, uh, you've been. You're aware of any of the uh, power industry. Well, I can understand why uh, uh, the uh, the accident, uh, you know, at Three Mile Island just scuttled the atomic power industry or nuclear power industry. Uh, I, I've I've heard recently. I've read that that uh, there may be some new uh, power reactors uh, on the drawing boards. But uh, whether they're going to get through uh, the regulations and approved, uh, it's hard to know. And yet, in France, I think it's about 80% of their power comes from uh, nuclear reactors. 
of their electric power, yeah. So as a member of the Manhattan Project, we haven't talked very much about the bomb. Is this, um, how do you feel about having contributed to the first atomic bombs? Uh, I have uh, amb ambivalent uh, feelings about it and uh, I'm, I'm very proud uh, that uh, to have worked on the project and gotten uh, and helped to get a weapon that ended the war. Uh, on the other hand, uh, at the time, uh, I was a signer of a petition, but somehow it didn't, uh, I, I think the sheet that I signed uh, never got back to the uh, to Dr. Szilard because it didn't appear in the hundred. My name doesn't appear in the hundred and fifty three names that that were shown. Uh, but uh, I signed a petition which, uh, in uh, in effect, suggested that the bomb not be dropped on a, uh, a city in Japan but uh, rather be uh, used, a bomb be used in a, in a demonstration. Now I, per myself, I didn't believe in the demonstration that was in the Szilard. He wanted a, a demonstration on an unpopulated island, as I recall. My feeling was that we should use it on a totally military target island of some kind uh, and uh, I don't know maybe there weren't any left by that time because uh, we were uh, we had pretty much taken most of the islands leading to Japan but that would have been my first wish is that it'd be dropped on a military target not on us not involving civilians but I don't think President Truman was wrong in his decision. Uh, the bombing of Tokyo, which did not involve atomic bombs, uh, destroyed Tokyo in effect and killed hundreds of thousands of people, or at least a hundred thousand. I mean, I, the same kinds of numbers that one atomic bomb killed, but nevertheless, it was the same result. Uh, multiple bombings uh, and burnt, burnt the city out in essence, just like Hiroshima was uh, destroyed by an atomic bomb. So that, and, and there's no doubt that it saved uh, many, many American lives. Uh, it was estimated that there would be a half a million casualties if we had to uh, uh, invade Japan. Uh, not half a million deaths, but half a million casualties, and that's a lot of casualties. Uh, so I think Truman was correct. I, I agree with his decision. I think you've done an excellent job, I think. Is there anything else that uh, occurs to you that we haven't talked about that you'd like to share? Um, I, I really can't think of anything okay. right now. All right. Well, you've done a beautiful well, job. Well, thank you. I hope so. I this hope it's adequate. A lot of wonderful things. Yes, thank you very fun. much for the opportunity. Well, I'm glad that yeah. uh, it was worth the trip. <laughs> <laughs>